and the floor is all yours. All right, thanks a lot, Oliver. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. I'm glad uh, you guys are able to join us. Uh, as Oliver mentioned, I'm the sales engineer here in the West region, and uh, today I'll be going over safety motion, exclusive area, and virtual fence. So let's get started. Uh, here's a quick agenda. Obviously, the three topics uh, that we'll be going over, and then uh, we'll end with the Q&A, which will also be um, questions will also be being answered in the chat here on the, on the panel on the side. So a little bit background before I get into safety motion and why we're kind of uh, getting into a topic like this. Well, safety has conventionally been a company-specific rule that's dependent on skilled laborers and people who know their way around the machinery. That in, in recent history is changing. Um, there's a lot more standards out there and they change from country to country. And there's a lot, there's kind of a bit of a shortage of skilled workers out there. So now the machines have a little bit more of a requirement to, to be safe around anybody who walks by them. Um, the locations of a lot of this machinery and, and automation in general is growing. So you have a lot of the new and developing countries, uh, Brazil, India, China, already well-developed countries that have different standards and, and different requirements um, and are starting to grow quite a bit in automation. Also, the changes in machinery. So now you have a lot of machines out there that require changes because the product's uh, changeover is quite quick and you're going from product to product on the same machine and you want more robust and flexible safety equipment on that. And as society the standards are starting to grow as automation grows and you know, becomes more widely used, the requirements and the standards are growing around that. That being said, I'll start with uh, what safety motion is. So safety motion is a function we have on our RC8A controller that's gonna allow your personnel to work near the Denso robot safely. And what this does is it defines areas around the work environment and you're able to sense and regulate the bodies and people personnel around it in predefined safety zones. And depending on where the person is relative to the uh, robotic cell, the robot will start to behave differently. Uh, by behave differently, I mean slow down the closer you get to it. Um, it's very flexible in the communication and different types of safety and sensory devices you can use. The standard um, typical ones are going to be your safety light curtains, floor mats, safety scanners, almost anything that can sense and detect where the person is relative to the machinery. And the key benefit, which you'll, you'll hear me talk about throughout the, the safety motion talk, is there's no need to reset the robot uh, when the operator comes close. As you'll see in a lot of industrial robot cells, when you have to go in there to grab something or engage with the cell, you have to shut everything down, e-stop it, and then restart the whole thing. The key benefit of this is there's no need for that downtime. Once you go near it, you can go about your business, and the robot will continue to work. All right, a question we always get, does Denso have collaborative robots? Uh, as most of you already know, we do have our off-the-shelf Kobata robot, which is a collaborative robot. But in terms of all of our whole robot line, the answer to that is yes. So with any of our robots, you're able to work without cages and work right next to people with the robot. And all of our robots can be set up this way, as I discussed, as long as you're able to incorporate some sort of safety device around it, it tells us where, where people are relative to the robot. And I'm going to clarify a lot of that with some images and videos here. Also, quickly before I get into the videos and the uh, different uh, images on it, I want to go over the standards. So the ISO and the RIA standard to what actually recognizes something as collaborative is two different type of operations. Uh, one being force monitoring. Uh, this requires the operator to be stuck, struck by the tooling or the robot before it stops. Uh, the second way is speed and distance monitoring. Uh, this is the type we're going to describe here where you're using some sort of scanner to stop the robot before it's struck. And, you know, typically even with the off-the-shelf uh, collaborative robots, it's really the cell or the application itself that would be considered collaborative. If you're selling off-the-shelf collaborative robots to Gillette and you're assembling razor blades, and now you have a razor blade at the end of the robot, it's, you're going to need some sort of caging or fencing around that. Uh, there's no way to apply force monitoring to that scenario because the force from that robot can be extremely um, hurtful. Is probably a better way to describe that, but obviously not a safe environment once you start applying applications like that. So a quick way to, do, to determine this is ask the customer, do you want to be hit by the robot before it stops or not? 
Uh, if you're like me and a and few people I've talked to, my counterparts, these robots, the collaborative ones that are supposed to be based on force monitoring, can still apply a significant amount of force. I mean, I've seen people's arms bruised, and it's not necessarily the safest way to do it. Here's a quick image on the right here that shows different uh, zones set up by a safety scanner. So based on which zone you're in, the robot will operate at different speeds. And on the left, you'll see just a quick I.O. schematic of where you would plug in your safety equipment and the input and output behind that. And this video actually does a great job of illustrating exactly what safety motion does. So you'll see that it's top speed here when it's furthest away. It decelerates when you get into that green zone. Slows down to close to a stop, but still moving. And then once you break into that red zone, completely stopped. It doesn't matter what you have on the end of arm tooling there. It's, it's going to come to a complete stop and be collaborative. And then as you see the gentleman moving out, it's going back to its normal operation and now at 100% full speed. So some different pros to the force monitored robots. Uh, the simple applications are, are they're perceived to be easy to program. Uh, it can be installed next to an operator if the proper risk assessment is performed. Uh, there's lots of different third party drivers. Sometimes no innovators required because it's supposed to be a, a simple setup. The cons to this, it, it can be very expensive. Uh, also, as mentioned before, the robot has to strike the operator before it actually stops. There's limited applications for this, and especially with the heavy payload robots, you have to move it very, very slow because, you know, at that size and that payload, hitting it at any sort of speed can create cause some damage. So typically safety departments will have light curtains installed after the fact when they realize that this can potentially be harmful. Uh, with speed and distance monitored robots, the number of pros there, typically it's cheaper than the force monitored robot. Uh, full robot capabilities, if you're not selling yourself short on speed or precision there. Uh, full speed production. Safety departments actually prefer the speed and distance monitored robots. Uh, they shut down before the human comes in contact with them. And again, just to keep harping on this fact, no need to stop production, no need to have any sort of downtime and reset. You just move close to it and move away to it and it continues its operation. The cons to this is the operator cannot be situated extremely close to it because once you get into that red zone, it's going to come to a complete stop, and especially not at a full-time basis. It requires a little bit more programming the first time you set it up. Uh, as with anything in automation, the first time you're using it and setting it up, there's going to be a little bit of programming involved. Uh, I have this slide in here, which I should have removed, but we'll be taking questions in the chat and then also at the end of the, the overall presentation here. The second feature I want to talk about is exclusive control. Um, exclusive control is a software license that allows you to have a shared area amongst robots. So a lot of times in assembly applications, you're picking up parts from different parts of the cell and you're bringing them into a shared area. Uh, again, this is a useful license when you're using multiple robots. No need for it if it's just a single robot operation, obviously. Um, it requires this license, but if you're using our dual arm uh, license and dual arm setup, it comes alongside it, and, and I'll touch on that briefly at the end of this also. Uh, and as I mentioned, excellent feature to have when you're having multiple areas, multiple robots working in the same area. Here's a schematic showing you how exclusive control uh, gets set up amongst controllers. So you'd have one master controller and then save con slave controllers beyond that. And here's an example of where it's showing you three separate shared areas that the robots are working in. Here's a quick overview of how the setup process starts. So you have both robots in automatic mode, and robot A enters as robot B is waiting. And then you put the, pull the robot A out of there and put it in manual mode, and B is, robot B is already in automatic mode, and you move that in. And then you can set up the exclusive area there and, and control the motion around that. Key benefits, a lot simpler programming. Uh, there's tighter monitoring. You're removing the deadlocks, and it monitors both the arm and the tooling. This is showing you an illustration of 
on the on the right side you'll see in, and in the background the wind caps environment for this and you'll see the blue areas once i start the video it'll be a little bit more clear and then in the lower left corner you'll see a video of the robots actually executing this and then that'll become enlarged and you can see it see that more clear as well so those are the three areas there the blue boxes uh, there's a simple code to the moves on the left and then here it's showing you the robots operating this environment. So pretty straightforward. Uh, you're just essentially saying, hey, this is an area both robots will be in, just don't be in it together. And then we'll move along to virtual fence. So virtual fence, this is more of a collision prevention function. So this you essentially create a fence around different objects in your cell, the robot, um, some other static stuff that's in the, in the cell itself. And it creates a mesh around the fenced areas to where it will uh, prevent collision. It stops the robot if anything runs into the fence and it's a predictive feature that, that plans the robot's path to avoid collision. Here's some images of what that would look like. On the left, you see that green mesh around the robot. And see in this one, it's fairly detailed. You see some pretty tight fencing around parts that's in your control. So you can control exactly how loose and how tight you want to make those fenced areas, depending on the nature of the collision prevention you're looking for. Some of the benefits to virtual fence are, obviously it avoids collision during recovery, reduces possible downtime due to damaged equipment, uh, and its ability to know if there's a potential collision before the robot even moves using our PAC script, PAC script commands. Uh, this is our dual arm function, which I'll touch on briefly here. So two of the features I've already discussed that are part of the dual arm control, and there's a third one called cooperative control. This allows you to use uh, both robots arms in a synchronized manner. So say there's uh, a part that requires a longer reach than our robots may have. This you can use two of them and set them up and synchronize them so they're moved the part together. Um, also in a situation where the payload may not be enough. Uh, you can double the payload by using two of the robots. And then exclusive control and virtual fence, we already discussed, both are included in the package of dual arm. And this is showing you an image of a shared area and how it was created in this application. Uh, this again is exclusive control, which we've already touched on. Virtual fence, we've already gone over as well, so we'll go too deep into this slide here. And then this is a video illustrating the shared area. And again, anytime you have an assembly application, this is pretty standard. Uh, you're usually picking up parts from multiple areas and moving them all into one assembly. As it waits and then comes in. There's another screw driving application similar where there's multiple operations being done in the same area. And this is actually a really cool video showing on Kubata that I mentioned earlier. These are off the shelf collaborative robots. And this is using virtual fence, it's an exclusive area. Um, so there's shared areas that it needs to operate within. And you can see this is very important in an application like this to set up the collision prevention with virtual fence as well. This is actually really cool. It'll shake the vial there, the beaker. And so as you can see, a lot of these features that I've mentioned are built so the robots can work in the same area, essentially making them collaborative to other robots. And that was the end of that. Uh, so we'll uh, take a look at the chat here. I'll open that up as well. And uh, any questions? Also, I have the link down here. We're starting some new webinars next week. So some other interesting topics on in the Denzel Robotics world. Uh, so please check the website out and copy and paste the link in and there'll be a whole schedule in there. Also, I, I have my email address and contact info up there. So feel free to reach out to me or your local regional sales manager anytime. We'd be happy to help.
All right. Great. Thanks, Jasper. Um, yeah, we're going to update this Denso Robotics webinars uh, website, um, I think, uh, Monday next week. So be prepared for that. I think we're going to start on Tuesdays, but um, it, it'll be updated. So just please take a look at that. Uh, let's see. Any questions? Doesn't look like we have too many questions, Jasper. But um, see here. I must have done a really good job explaining. <laughs> I think it's uh, it's Friday. People are trying to, you know, enjoy the weather. <laughs> Forget about this COVID. It wasn't uh, maybe they did understand everything. But uh, let's see. Nobody has any questions. Well, if there are no questions, um, again, Jasper is going to email and get back to everyone that attended with this PowerPoint, as well as a recorded uh, link to the webinar that we just had, we just gave. And so you can go over that on your own time. Um, if there are no other questions, uh, everyone enjoy the weekend. So thanks again, Jasper. Yep, thanks guys, have a great weekend.